Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. To discuss the pros and cons of the issue and the bill, we're extremely fortunate to have with us First, one of the leading figures in the non-Orthodox community of America, Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld, Executive Vice President of the Rabbinical Assembly, the International Association of Conservative Rabbis, who has been extremely outspoken in opposition to the Rotem Bill. And to represent the Orthodox perspective, we are also most pleased to be joined by Rabbi Stephen Prusansky, Vice President of the Rabbinical Council of America, the organization of Orthodox rabbis around the world. And Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you both. Uh, you know, Julie, we heard David Rotem say that one of the things he wanted to do was convince you, <laughs> you, as um, the leader of conservative, really conservative rabbin around the world, to accept this notion that all he wants to do is make it easier for local rabbis to perform conversions in Israel. And yet you have written a number of pieces. You're quoted in the JTA where uh, you basically, I, don't, I think I'm going to read this to our audience. Julie has written, most of the representatives in APAC are conservative and reform who work day and night for Israel in the U.S. But when these people arrive in Israel, they are treated as non-Jews, chairs are thrown at them at the Kotel, the Western Wall. The police arrest them. You need to understand that a threat to our relations with Israel is a threat to the resilience and security of the country. And again, you've been very outspoken that you feel the Rotem conversion bill would change the whole nature and dynamic and relationship between Israel and non-Orthodox Jews in the diaspora. I want you to explain why. Thank you, Mark. Uh, First, and thank you so much for having me on the show, uh, and Rabbi Prochansky, it's really wonderful to get to share this occasion with you. Uh, this is an incredibly important moment in the history of world Jewry, and in fact, this is what they call an inflection point. What happens at this moment will, I think, have a major impact upon our future direction as a worldwide Jewish community. In fact, Mark, I, today I wrote and released an open letter to Prime Minister Netanyahu calling upon him to inscribe his name in the annals of great Jewish leaders by speaking out directly and publicly against this bill which will divide the diaspora from Israel. And by the way, thank you. An excellent introduction to a very complicated subject. And the seriousness is the following. First of all, we have, of course, a terrible conundrum in the state of Israel that we all love so much and are so unequivocally committed to. And you read a statement which I think captures really a, a campaign that I have been on for quite some time, which is for Israel and the diaspora to understand that the old equation, which has said that the diaspora Jewish community will not speak out mm -hmm. when Israeli practice, as it relates to world Jewry, goes against our values, that equation, which said we must do that for Israel's security, you know, we must be silent, we can't uh, criticize Israel, that equation has changed. And what is unambiguously clear is that Israel's security is dependent upon world Jewry looking towards this country that we all share a tremendous love of and interest in and saying, we want you to be the robust democracy that you can be. And when I see a bill potentially being signed into law that creates a direct path between one small, extreme religious point of view, and I do not want to associate it with a denomination. Rabbi Prujansky and I were just discussing my, uh, you know, members of my family who you know in, in your local community. This is not about denomination. We are a part of one healthy community here. This is about one extreme, narrow point of view and creating a direct path 
between it and the law of return, which is the greatest expression of a Jewish acknowledgement of how perilous it has been, how bold and brave to be a Jew throughout history, yes. right? Yes. And the very fact that we would reverse that, that we would say that the righteous convert who chooses to cast our lot with us, that we would imperil their safety by cutting them off from the law of return because they do not conform to one very narrow religious definition of what it means to perform mitzvot. This is anathema in my mind to the Jewish people, number one. Number two, it is absolutely improper and crosses any boundaries in terms of what the Knesset should be voting on. I understand that to a point which has become tragic, we don't have separation of church and state in Israel and we in must... In one very minor area. It, Minor but significant. But significant. We have a spirit in Israel where because of um, really politics, because of yes. the vagaries of parliamentary politics, a very small group has gotten a tremendous amount of political power. And so we see these horrible images on television that actually threaten Israel's safety. Why and how? They threaten Israel's safety because my congregants, right, who form the backbone of APAC and who defend Israel before the world, defend an Israel, that is the only robust democracy, the only democracy at all in that region in the face of totalitarian religious regimes. And when we see on the same Sunday, the same Rosh Chodesh Av, in which this bill was reintroduced in a stealth move, right, which is a separate matter that we should talk about, in a stealth move, I went to bed Motzei Shabbat and understood myself to be in a very constructive, well-received dialogue mm -hmm. with Natan Sharansky, mm -hmm. right, and I woke up Sunday morning and found that this had, notwithstanding David Rotem's assurances, been reintroduced in a much more extreme and pernicious form than we had ever seen it before. I understand the passion, and I think most American Jews would agree 100% with you, even Orthodox Jews. But I don't understand how the Rotem bill does the things you are saying yes. frighten you in this context. Could you explain to me, what is it about the Rotem bill that makes you feel that, for example, the, there's a breach now between church and state, to use the terms that don't apply to Israel, yes. but yes. The, the, the way American Jews imagine it. Explain to me what the real danger is if the Rotem bill not only passes committee, but now passes the Knesset. Thank you. First of all, we have the matter. The bill has three parts. There is a clear section in Article 3 which refers to the law of return and which would have an effect on the law of return. How? Well, I, well, I want to say that already, as it left committee on Sunday, uh, David Rotem was saying again that that part would not appear finally <clears throat> in the bill. So I don't know how much time you want to spend addressing the third article of if, the bill. It, it, maybe it's something we would discuss if, in fact, it doesn't get taken out. Although I were, would, if I were you, be more suspicious of some of the things he's promised, given the fact that, as you said, you were really promised many things when he was here. And I'm very disappointed as an American Jew yes. that some of these things were, were, I don't know, what Sharansky calls a betrayal. But I, again, I want you to be as specific as possible, and then I, I want Stephen the opportunity to explain By all any means. different perspective. By all means. But what is it By that, all what means. is it the threat, what can happen By to American means. Jewry, who, uh, to American Jews converted in, in America because of this bill that wouldn't have happened to them a week ago? The difference is, for the last 20 years, the one avenue for any redress of justice for the, the non-Orthodox in terms of issues of conversion has been through the high court. Mm -hmm. And the high court, tragically, because Israel does not have a constitution and they themselves must be very careful in how they address these issues, has been a way in which significant gains actually have been made for non-Orthodox converts to Judaism. Can you give in one example? Sure. So uh, if you are converted by the Masorti movement. Conservative movement in Israel. Conservative movement in Israel. Or if you are converted by one of my colleagues here in the United States and you wish to make Aliyah, you are eligible for the law of return. You are eligible to be for the citizenship mm -hmm. law. And you can apply through Misrad HaPnim, through the Ministry of the Interior. Exactly and become right. an Israeli citizen. Okay. Right? And who converted you at the moment is almost irrelevant. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, that same person does not yet have 
Jewish status as it pertains to issues of marriage, issues Correct. of burial. And in fact, that it's a, it's a very complex set of four or five uh, cases that have been before the Supreme Court, but it is probably no coincidence that we are about to see the decision coming forward on one of the last of those cases. Okay, I want to make sure everybody understands. Even if a Jew, a person, converted by a conservative rabbi in Israel, at the moment can obtain Israeli citizenship under the law of return, Correct. that does not mean that when it comes time for that person, if he is unmarried when he makes Aliyah, if he wants to marry somebody in Israel, he still must undergo a process by which he is given a certain kind of hexer, approval, he's accepted, to be married by an Orthodox rabbi in Israel, because in Israel only Orthodox rabbis have the right to marry. And therefore, even if he is granted citizenship under the law of return, your point is there could be a question raised about whether he could marry a Jew in Israel. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. I am also saying that the passage of this law would potentially overturn these Supreme Court decisions. Which at the moment have granted the status necessary for these converts converted by a conservative rabbi to marry in Israel. And would therefore reverse 20 years of progress made by the Reform and Masorti movement in Israel in terms of granting rights to Jews by choice. Oh, Stephen, I want to ask you the same question. From your perspective, and you've heard some of Julie's concerns here, that there is a, a real anxiety, fear, concern that basically this is going to change the status, the way who is a Jew is determined, and it's going to have a deleterious impact on non-Orthodox Jews who in some way want to interact with the State of Israel, make Aliyah, create a life there, then they bring their children there, they may want to marry. It, to what extent do you feel either she is missing something or that's something that must be added to this discussion? It will have very little effect, if any effect at all. I want to give a little perspective here. There's been a canard that's been extant probably for 40 years now that somehow the law of return targets conservative Jews or reform Jews. It has nothing to do with any reform Jew, conservative Jew, reconstructionist Jew, atheist Jew, or orthodox Jew. It speaks about Jews. And as we define Jews, people born of a Jewish mother, or converted according to halacha, there's no conservative Jew, reformed Jew, born of a Jewish woman, who's at all affected by this. A member of a reformed right. congregation who 10 years earlier was converted by a reformed rabbi. Does the law of return make an issue? That's all controversy. That goes back already 40 years. At and that's the moment. Been a struggle since 1969. But my understanding at the moment is it does not. Well, it does not. In, in fact, the early struggle in the late 1960s was to add the phrase converted according to halacha. Those Which was not words. added. That's, it was not added. Correct. Right. My understanding is that the state of Israel went out of its way, and you gave an example of how, not to make its secular law of return a religious matter. And that, in fact, nobody asks a Reformed Jew for some kind of proof of an Orthodox conversion under the Jewish, under the Israel's right of return, under the law of return. You mean a Reformed Jewish convert? Yes. That's correct. Well, that's different. A Reformed Jewish convert now can apply under the and law of return. there's no issue. No issue at all. Okay, and so I'm well, asking... my point is the average Reformed conservative is unaffected by this. Unaffected. My understanding is, though, that we, what you just said was that the Rotem bill could have an impact on a person converted in a reformed congregation who, after the Rotem bill is passed, wants to return to Israel under the law of return. Yes. From what I've heard, as Julie characterized well, the bill, well, how, that would be a change. Okay. That's a, that's, a, that's a humongous change. It's not that great a change because it, it, how many reformed it or doesn't conservative matter how many. converts Ten. are coming to Israel? Ten. But then I would say 20. to you that every, let's say it's 20, every country has the right to determine its citizenship. Yes, but this isn't be being done by the country. It's being done by the Knesset. Okay. You don't... Julie said you, you support a robust democracy in Israel. Well, this is democracy. Democracy means you put bills to a vote. There's pressure on both sides, which I respect. And then they vote based on what they think is in the best interest of the country. Sometimes they get it right. Okay. Sometimes they get it wrong. In your opinion, would it be in the best interest of the, it's a, you know because it is, and Julie made this point, because it is a parliamentary system of government, 
in these issues, it might be a minority that wins for political reasons. But I'm asking you, whether it's a majority or a minority, do you think it would be good for the state of Israel to have a law of return which basically delegitimizes a significant portion of American Jewry? I don't believe the bill is delegitimizing any significant aspect of okay, American Jewry. Okay, insignificant. Do you a think... very insignificant aspect okay, of American so Jewry. So the only thing that, that at the moment makes you comfortable with this bill is that you don't think enough Jews are, are impacted. No, what makes me comfortable with the bill is that, as I believe and as I espouse, conversion should be based according to halacha. Not and according if to... If 100,000 converts in the Reform and Conservative movement wanted to come to Israel, 100,000. Give any number you want. At some number, that you're gonna, we're going to cross a threshold for you. Whatever the number is. It's not a question of numbers. Do, that's right. Do you believe it's in Israel's interest to create a system which delegitimizes a major portion of American Jewry? Ask the question another way. Israel has a mechanism under its laws of citizenship by which non-Jews can become citizens of Israel. You don't understand. I understand you completely. You don't understand. At the moment, Israel is an embracing, embraces world Jewry and says, you know what, how you're converted, where you daven, what halacha you do or do not follow, that's a matter of personal choice. But in terms of Klal Yisrael, it's not an issue for us. And what you want to do is dramatically change the nature of the state of Israel. No, not at all. What you're saying is not settled law. As Jews come to Israel, then they're welcome to Israel. But what you're suggesting is that an outsider to the Jewish people who join the Jewish people under non-Orthodox auspices must therefore necessarily be accepted by the state of Israel that's a different matter altogether. How have you lived with it up till today? By the way, today... It, we have not lived with it. It's been a source of constant controversy okay. since the 1960s. Okay, but for some, for some reason, Israel and world Jewry has been overwhelmingly comfortable. The Israeli people have been overwhelmingly comfortable. And a small, a very small slice of world Jewry, a very small slice, is uncomfortable with it. Well, I'd say a very small slice is affected by, but the bill addresses a much broader and more important concern. What issue is that? How to incorporate as Jews, as Jews of the Soviet Union who came to the land of Israel as Jews, even though they're not halachic Jews. And that's the by, question. That's right. And what Rotem that's wants, the main issue wait, here. What Rotem wants to do is make it as easy as possible. Right. That's what I the, find fault the, with the bill. For these Jews to become part of Ju the Jewish people. Right. They want to be Israeli, what they're, asking they're surfing for. the Israeli army, yes. they consider themselves Jews, let them become Jews. And I understand that from an Orthodox perspective, that sounds like we're cheating. Yes, yes it is. I understand. Let them become but, Israelis. But to world Jewry, to world Jewry, it's the reality. And, I, and you have been able to explain in very clear ways the way in which the Rotem bill threatens the nature, identity, definition, not only of world Jewry, but more specifically here, the state of Israel. But it doesn't and, at all. No, it, do, no, it doesn't you can, at all. You can, say, you can say you're glad it does. No, no, no. On the, on the very circumscribed method of description of the bill, that might be true. But what the bill is saying does not address any conservative reform Jew at all. At all. It speaks about, if it does, converts who are making aliyah. That is a minuscule group of people. It doesn't, the ma we itself, said, it doesn't matter how, what the number is. Of course it matters. Because tomorrow it could be an overwhelming number. If, you said to me a moment ago, number doesn't matter. If an overwhelming number of Reform conservative Jews decide to make Aliyah, converts. And hundreds of thousands, converts decide to make Aliyah, so that itself would be testimony to a, uh, a, a legitimacy of the conversions, that they want to identify the Jewish people like that. But in fact, that's not the issue. We're talking about a rabbi issue, not a people issue. And that's where I take real issue with it, because the rabbis are involved in raising people's hackles over an issue that will not touch my, your, or your life at all, nor of any of our congregants. Why not our congregants? I unless, unless they're converts who want to make aliyah. Yes, and why are they not important to you? They're, they're very important to me. 
So why do you say it doesn't change the life? Mm -hmm. It changes the life of because these people. Because we have, like any people, any religion, any nation in the world, we have a methodology by which people join. And at the moment, the I don't have the, uh, but my point is yeah. that up until the Rotem Bill, there was an agreed upon methodology. It was a methodology the Jewish world has lived with for decades. It was agreed upon after much controversy and only because of a vote that took place in the Knesset and a ruling of the Supreme Court. Keep in mind the basic point, we're not only talking about citizenship in the state of Israel, we're talking about membership in the Jewish people. That's not it, quite it, the same thing. Well, exactly. That's for generations. Ex That's for posterity. Ex exactly right. The issue is that we are talking about membership in a worldwide Jewish people. That's correct. Right? We, we do agree on and that. And that I never delegated I, I, to the High Court of Justice I, I, in Israel. Well, let's get back to that in a second. I, I want, if we may, to just talk a little bit about the system and a little bit about the bill. And, and you're bringing up some good points that I think we ought to get back to. Uh, but th there is indeed this bottleneck. There is indeed, I think all admit, flaws in the system that have allowed this number of years to go by and so few people to be converted. In fact, notwithstanding the fact that tens of millions of shekelim are spent on these conversion courts, the total number of conversions performed in Israel a year is 1,500. 200 of those are through the Masorti movement, at which receives no funding. Right. So we have a clearly a failing system here because somehow if there are indeed and there are 320,000, 350,000, 400,000, right, several hundred thousand uh, citizens from the former Soviet Union who want to join the Jewish people and only 1,500 people in total who are succeeding, there is some way in which these aspirations of this large number of people and the system which permits it are not working together. Right. And the fact, as you point out, right, and I think it's clear in the bill, it's not something that's debatable, that the ultimate authority for these courts remains under the same auspices. Right. We would have these more opportunities for local um, judges, right, for local courts. But ultimately, all of them are answerable at the present time to Rabbi Amar, right. Rabbi Amar's tenure goes on for a few more years. Um, but to whoever is the president of the court right. in that before, that's how before you be. answer, I, yeah. I, I want to make sure I understand. Yes. My sense was that what the Rotem bill does is give more autonomy to the local rabbis. And that it's only if there's an issue does it go to some kind of centralized authority. I, I it, think it, the, the chief rabbinate's role is to invalidate conversions that they felt were should be invalid. But on a a priori basis, they would accept the conversions of the local right. rabbis. And therefore, You're correct in that sense. And therefore, and that's what I meant by saying that ultimately this bill was going to give on the ground local rabbis a greater opportunity to perform more conversions. That's correct. There's a strength in that, and I think the local rabbis should have more power. But there's I thought a you don't, there's you a don't flaw like in that, that as you well like because that. it because it depends on the various pressures that are placed on the rabbi. You want them to be hands-on involved and not simply sign certificates. I think if Israel's to be the Jewish state, you need the broadest possible acceptable definition of conversion or you do create a two-tiered system within Israel. Converts that are accepted as Jews and converts that are not accepted as Jews, and that's a problem. Now, if only fifth. Just clarify, not accepted as Jews by who? By the by, by the Israeli society, by the religious establishment. After all, the definition the, is those not. Those two things are are not in any way on the same page as to what Judaism right, is Jewishness about. The is, religious yes. establishment in the Israeli society could not be more separate. We are operating from a historic definition of Jewishness that goes back to the Bible, to the Talmud, to the Rambam, to the Shulchan Aruch. I, down to today. I agree that you, we you are, agree, and we come to different conclusions. I, I, right. I, you, I agree, you would agree that, it, that, you would agree that a change was made sometime in the last two or three centuries as to the definition of Jewishness. Look, a reform movement in the early 1980s with the patrilineal descent ruling, which is clearly not uh, accepted by the Torah. But we have to embrace the fact that if Israel's to be a Jewish state, you want the broadest possible definition. You could accept my conversion. Conversions. I may not be able to accept your conversions. I, I think the approach that we should take is one that communities, common organizations, have always taken regarding the provision of food at a joint celebration. There are Jews who eat kosher food exclusively and Jews who don't. Yet if you want to be inclusive, you'd serve kosher food because nothing prohibits 
say, a, uh, a non-observant Jew from eating kosher food, whereas the Jew who eats kosher is prohibited. But, but, but here you have a significant portion and a growing portion of the Israeli community that simply does not accept ah, them as Jews, ah, not just yes. Israelis. But, okay, hold on. I, I want to make sure everyone understands. We've gotten to the nub. Oh, this is the nub. And the issue becomes, I want to say this to the two of you, and then you but want to. But I do want to respond. I, I, I'm going to let you respond. You understand, my own perspective is that there are different movements of Judaism which have different views of what it means to say that the Torah comes from God, the Torah is from Sinai, and what halacha means. The Orthodox have one view of this. The conservative view is different. Yes. And the reform movement has evolved also in, yes. a different, in, in a different way. Okay. And I respect the fact that different Jews have different understandings of what happened at Sinai and how Jewish life is to be lived. I understand that. I also understand that it's harder for an Orthodox Jew to accept the validity of the non-Orthodox approach than it is for a non-Orthodox Jew to say, even though I disagree with the Orthodox, at least I understand where they're coming from. Correct. I get that. And for me, when it comes to the state of Israel, there's a different criteria. The criteria of Israel is not about halakha. It is not about religion. It's about amcha, the klal Yisrael of the Jewish people. And the issue is, to what extent is the Orthodox Jew going to say, you don't have to eat kosher, but I do. Therefore, in a meal, let's all eat kosher. I understand that. I don't understand if it's to be applied to the nature of Jewish life in general. And the state of Israel has been a secular Jewish state. Now, I presented a statement, and you had an interesting response. I said, we have 320,000 people, we have a system that costs tens of millions of shekels a year, and we have 1,500 converts. And Stephen, your response was to say that is because perhaps, no, you assert, that, that the likely explanation is because there are only 1,500 people who actually qualify by their observance of mitzvot to be Jewish. And that's, that's why there are 1,500. That's a, okay. So my question then is, if that is the case, then what will this bill accomplish? Right? If the correct standards by which to admit people into the Jewish people are such that out of these 320,000 people, up to this point we're only seeing 1,500 a year, then why do we have the bill at all, frankly? That is part of the uneasiness that I, as an Orthodox rabbi, feel about the bill. Because if the intention, by delegating to local authority, is to water down the standards of conversion to uh, Judaism, then I am against the bill. Well, I, I don't want the, the standards. And of course it, it, it appears, is. It appears. Of course it no, is. It might no. be. It might be correct. But, it is. but then you'd there be impugning is, every there local it, rabbi there in Israel. There is in the Jewish world an understanding that there are people who want to become part of the Jewish people who will become part of the Jewish people, who will not accept an orthodox view of mitzvot. Analogously, of a Portuguese coming to America and saying, I want to be an American citizen, but I will not swear allegiance to the entire Constitution of the United States. I do not like Article 2. Different Jews understand Torah differently. And you are insisting, and I understand why you do, but I want you to understand that the vast majority of committed Jews to Torah view Torah very differently than you do. And it's I, not. I, I and agree it's, with that. And it's not that they're not swe swearing allegiance to the Jewish Constitution, which is the Torah. But, I, the, I, I, but I, the sense, the interpretation of Torah, the meaning of Torah is so different from the meaning that it has for you. And I don't begrudge that to you. But I am saying your standard of Torah cannot be the standard for the state of Israel. Well, that's your opinion. That's right. I, I guess of course it's my opinion. They'll, they'll put it to and a vote it, in the Knesset. And, but I think, by the way, it's more been God. that way since the, since the law of well, return. That's because of the, the, the imperiousness of the high court in Israel. No, but it's you because it's, the, your will, case, by it's the, way. the will of the Jewish people. But it is not in the hands of one small group of people to define this for world Judaism. But it I, simply is uh, But I isn't. never said it's in the hands of the Knesset. I'm a Jew. I'm a rabbi. I never gave them the right to determine who is a Jew. I never said, okay, call a guy who wants to eat a bagel and give to UJA, call him a Jew. I never gave him that right. So who are they to tell me who my brother is? My brothers are those you're, who accept the Torah. Quite right. A non-Jew enters I, the Jewish I world and accepts the Torah. I never gave the Knesset the right to hand off 
the meaning of Jewish identity to a small group of people with a particular point of view that yields from 320,000 people who live in the state of Israel and want to be Jewish and are willing to live and die for the Jewish people, only 1,500 converts but, but a year. You, I never gave that. You're we right. Don't have, but you, but gave but you say the small group, yeah. if they have the votes in the Knesset, it's not a small group, it's a majority. We are, we are merging two separate issues. But, we are merging the issues, and that's, of course, the problem with the bill, that's right? That's correct. Right? We well, are merging two issues. We are merging the issues of politics, which is how the bill comes to be such a, frankly, not useful solution to the problem. Again, legislation so, is you, always like that, David, even in America. David Rotem and, and, and you, Stephen, do not have the same point of view on this bill. That's right? correct. I, but sat, I at least respect his effort I, to try I to sat, reach out in a productive sat, way to I those sat, Russian Jews. I sat in several meetings non -Jews. with him in which he said his bill will solve this problem within a year. Right? This bill will solve this problem within a year. I fail to see. It's hard to, to see, believe that. But, on, on this, we agree. Right. I fail to see. Right, how a bill that still leaves the authority with the same group of people who yield fifteen hundred conversions a year again, which you think is is proper and no, no, I, think I didn't say improper. it's proper. I don't know. I can't make that judgment because I don't know the case. Look, I sat uh, two years ago as a guest on one of the conversion courts in Israel, just to observe the proceedings. It was a fellow in the he was a Russian Jew, a Russian non-Jew, in the uh, pipeline for a year, and he was very close to conversion. And his teacher came to report to the court. He relapsed in the sense that he drove from Jerusalem to the beach the previous uh, Shabbat. So the conversion was delayed. That would delayed. make his life sound like a disease. His life is not a disease. His life well, is an aspiration it, to get closer and, to God and Torah but through and Jewish God's people. God's Torah, correct. So if we but pause it, you might not. But the definition of relapse, but, I think, speaks very much to the issue. Because the way in well, they which spoke you are... Hebrew, the way, I'm translating. The way yeah, in you which, meant it. The way right. in which, you meant it. The way in, other words, in which you are defining the life outside of this, I won't say narrow definition, I'll say particular, let's say particular definition, right? The way you are defining life outside of this particular definition is somehow an illness. It is somehow... I'm not saying it's an illness. I am saying it's a distortion, to be quite frank. It's, to me, it's inauthentic, but that doesn't mean Jews don't espouse it and are taught it. And, they are and if they embrace it, espouse. one can argue whether it's beneficial or not. But if you want to come from the outside as a non-Jew and become a Jew, then you have to embrace the totality of the package. But Stephen, we have to live together, right? The, the fact, if, if your goal, well, I want to go back to the statement you said before, when you said, look, the best thing to do, if we have people who eat kosher and people who don't eat kosher, we should have kosher food, because those who do not eat kosher can eat that. But you see that it doesn't stop there, right? There's the definition, as we know, of what is kosher, right? There's the Vada Rabbanim of Queens, and they don't eat from the Vada Rabbanim el elsewhere. Well, that's not true. Uh, but, uh... And, and <laughs> what the point that you get to eventually is that there's nothing to eat for any of us. I don't believe that's and true. And we that, don't want to see With all due respect, Julie, point. it's an exaggeration, because in terms of kashras, there are variations in standard that, I'm, that are minute, but for the most part, when common organizations put out kosher food, everyone knows that they could eat it. So too, if Israel's to be a Jewish state, then the, the definition of Jewishness should be as all-inclusive as possible. But your definition is the least inclusive. That's the problem. No, because everyone could accept my definition, even you. No, 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 no. No, no one no, is no, accepting no. your definition. Oh, a very small I think group you mean is that. accepting your definition. I do mean that. And I want you to understand that's where you're wrong. So that was a question you asked before. Why would you not accept an Orthodox conversion? Why would you not accept one? I can't imagine any reason not to accept so it. So then it is the most inclusive. No. No, what I'm saying is... Ideologically, I am it's saying, the most inclusive. No, I am saying, I, no, I, am saying I, I could accept an orthodox conversion, but I can accept non-orthodox conversion as well. You cannot. You I, are entitled, Stephen, to your point of right. view. You are entitled further to hold, upholding the rectitude of your point of view. What you are Please? not entitled to is to do what this bill is doing and what I would suggest you are also doing in a slightly different way, which is to say that the point of view of anybody, that yours is some kind of un unimpeachable gold standard. It is not. It is your point of view. The mere fact that a page of the Talmud not only has differing points of view, but preserves the point of view that did not become the dominant one and preserves it for all generations, speaks to the fact that Judaism's strength, that in fact the survival of our people,
has depended on our ability to hold differing points of view and still live together as Klal Yisrael. The we reason together, that this I... bill is threatening to destroy not only Israeli society, but to drive a rift between Israel and the diaspora is that it holds, and the Rabbanut in Israel holds, that there is, and I think you are saying this as well, that there is only one acceptable point of view. And the difficulty is that we won't be able to live that way. And those are the thoughts of Julie Schoenfeld, Executive Vice President of the Rabbinical Assembly, and Rabbi Stephen Prusansky, Vice President of the Rabbinical Council of America. We hope you enjoyed hearing their discussion. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to this sensitive issue. Please email me or write me this week. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support.